Hi, I'm Jeanette Roche. This is Bridge City News. Here are some of the top stories we've been following. Police investigate gunshots fired on a Lethbridge residence. Plus, some much needed changes coming to Lethbridge Airport. And Edmonton doctors are calling on the province to reinstate COVID testing, tracing, and isolation. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Jeanette Roche. Thanks for joining us. Lethbridge police are investigating an early morning incident where several gunshots were fired at a home in the 1800 block of 2B Avenue North. Neighbors say they saw a vehicle leaving the back alley behind the home at around 6 a.m. Wednesday. No one was injured and police believe this was a targeted incident. If you have any information, you're asked to contact LPS at 403-328-4444. A group of Edmonton doctors is calling on the Alberta government to reinstate COVID-19 testing, tracing, and isolation requirements. Ten physicians with the Edmonton Zone Medical Staff Association have signed an open letter that draws attention to threats posed by the Delta variant and the potential for pediatric and adult intensive care units be to become overwhelmed. The association says Alberta is going against advice from Health Canada, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the World Health Organization. The group is asking the province to review its data and provide a sound evidence. Alberta Premier Jason Kenney says the decision to end isolation requirements, contact tracing, and asymptomatic testing for COVID was based on science and data. Kenney spoke to reporters Tuesday for the first time since Alberta's Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Dina Hinshaw, announced the changes last Wednesday. Yes, I understand the concern, and uh, no, it's not a direction I asked her to pursue. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of emotion in the COVID debate. Uh, from the beginning, and that's entirely understandable. Uh, people are understandable, have been understandably anxious about uh, both uh, the disease itself and the damaging effect of restrictions. Um, with respect to the announcement made by Dr. Hinshaw last week, uh, this is something that she and her team and the public health branch of the Department of Health, uh, all of them uh, uh, professional uh, members of the Permanent Public Service, uh, developed over some time. Uh, presented it to our COVID cabinet committee, I believe on July the 8th, uh, and uh, we accepted without modification uh, the proposal that came forward from the Chief Medical Officer of Health, uh, which is based on science and data, uh, particularly on the powerful science and data behind the protective effect of the vaccines, which has, as she says, dramatically changed the context of COVID-19. Alberta's opposition NDP, meanwhile, is calling for a public inquiry into Kenny and his government's handling of the COVID-19 crisis. For her part, Dr. Dina Hinshaw is acknowledging her words have caused confusion, fear and anger. In a column sent to various media, media outlets, Hinshaw says lifting isolation requirements, asymptomatic testing and eliminating contact tracing will allow the province to focus on other health threats such as opioid deaths and a syphilis. Hinshaw says isolation measures were incredibly disruptive and are no longer necessary with vaccine protection. We're less than a month away until students go back to the classroom and Lethbridge post-secondary institutions are planning and organizing what the upcoming semester will look like. Currently, both Lethbridge College and the University of Lethbridge are planning to have all students back on campus in September. Vice Provost at the U of L, Michelle Helstein, says plans are still being developed, but some restrictions are expected to remain in place. What we know about our campus is that it's, it's nuanced, it's complex, uh, and so we have to take in, you know, to, into account all of those realities. And that's what we're engaged with with our Health and Safety Advisory Committee uh, at the moment. And what that's going to mean uh, is, you know, we do anticipate that there's probably going to be uh, some measures in place that exceed the current government expectations for us. But as they've indicated, you know, they've set out a set of plans, but they've also said that institutions and businesses uh, will need to take their own realities into effect as as they engage uh, their planning, and, and that's what we're doing. Both institutions are expected to make a finalized announcement around the middle of August.
As well, both school divisions in Lethbridge say they're working on finalizing plans for the upcoming year. But with the constantly changing restrictions, no final decisions have been made. In a statement from the Lethbridge School Division, reads in part, quote, we are staying abreast of the COVID changes and will structure return to school accordingly. It goes on to say a Lethbridge School Division will review and follow the updated return to school guidelines. If everything remains on track, class quarantine protocols goals will not be a challenge. This will mean interruption to delivery of instruction will be minimal, end quote. Extended care employees working in Alberta aren't pleased with the latest announcement that 4% of employees' wages will be cut by Canada's largest private home care provider. The cuts come shortly after Alberta Health Services offered a similar package to their unionized members working in AHS, General Support Services. Vice President with the Alberta Union of Provincial Employees, Bobby Joe Boardy, says the hardest part of the announcement is the timing as Alberta inches its way out of the pandemic. What COVID did, what this pandemic did, was shine a light on um, the long-term care facilities and the folks that work in those important roles. And up until the pandemic, I, I dare say that they weren't, they weren't given the credit that they deserved, but the pandemic really um, showed how, how much work they do, how necessary they are, and they're heroes. And so to have come through one of the most difficult times in, in any of our lives, um, there is included. And then to be told now that thanks for your service, but you're no longer needed, it's, uh, it's a slap in the face. AUPE says they are going to continue to fight the recent announcement to keep the jobs in place. Mortgage broker Ryan Wolf is hoping to connect with voters in Lethbridge for the city's municipal election later in the year. Wolf is running to become a city councillor. As Micah Quinn reports, he says this was the perfect time to run with the current challenges facing Lethbridge. Ryan Wolf is campaigning on the promise of getting Lethbridge businesses back on track after the pandemic. I want to be a part of seeing families and businesses prosper again in Lethbridge and to make sure that we sustain that. So that's my big, I think, focus is that to the extent we can help businesses and people prosper, then the stuff that we need to happen socially in the city will come. Wolf says one of the main problems Lethbridge needs to deal with is the recent announcement of the city ranking highest in Canada on the Crime Severity Index. But at the end of the day, it's called law enforcement. And we need to have the police feel like they're allowed to do their job and that there's support for them there. And so I, I do want to be a part of a, of a solution where the police feel like they're adequately, adequately supplied and staffed. Wolf will also be focusing on social issues within the city, like homelessness and addictions. He says he drove to Medicine Hat to hear from Jamie Rogers and the Medicine Hat Community Housing Society after the city became the first in Canada to end chronic homelessness. Wolf says Lethbridge could potentially implement some of Medicine Hat's strategies regarding homelessness. And so that's one thing that I want to be part of a solution for is where we just start to act and get informed about different strategies that are working in different municipalities and then bring them here and start to move the needle. We are not going to solve it in one year, two years, but the people of Lethbridge are telling us, move the needle. And that's what we need to do, which thus far um, council struggled to do. The 2021 Lethbridge Municipal Election is set for October 18th. For Bridge City News, I'm Micah Quinn. The Lethbridge Airport is set to receive some much-needed improvements in the form of customer experience. The City of Lethbridge received over $580,000 through an initiative from Western Economic Diversification Canada that will be given to the airport. There are plans to install a common-use terminal system, self-check-in, baggage system upgrade, powered mobile wheelchairs, and a visual passenger paging system. This uh, particular grant, what we're looking at is how can we improve the passenger experience that we can control, not necessarily the airlines, but what we can have in the terminal. So when we have a new baggage carousel system, which you see uh, what we have right now, it looks like a chute that you're delivering bags of coal down. Um, that's quite a, a, a step up. Uh, wheelchair access for accessibility, paging systems for the hard of hearing people. Those are all nice little features that are, are great improvements for passenger experience. 
This announcement comes after Lethbridge City Council invested over $2 million to secure $23 million in funding for the airport through the provincial and federal government. The new customer additions to the airport are expected to be completed by March of next year. As wildfires rage across British Columbia, the Okanagan's sky has been obscured by smoke for weeks. However, some recent rain in Kelowna has made blue skies visible once again. Melody Rommel says she's happy to see the air clear up in the Smokinoggin. This is actually the first time I've seen blue sky in weeks. I <laughs> uh, haven't seen the sun or the moon even for quite a while. So it's, it's actually really refreshing to see. Uh, the sun right now actually looks yellow instead of pink. And um, before that, it was, uh, you know, we all joked about it being like a zombie apocalypse out there, just totally uh, overcast everywhere. And you can't see the mountains. You couldn't see sometimes the buildings of the street across from your house. So it was quite depressing. It's been actually uh, quite lifting of the spirits today to see the sun in the blue skies finally. BC Wildfire Service Operations Director Rob Schweitzer says the rains were a welcome relief to firefighter crews, but hot weather is expected in the southern interior for the next few days. He says it's been a week of steady progress in fighting the fires, which number around 250. The BC government also says it's extended its wildfire state of emergency until August 18th, allowing it to support those who are under evacuation orders or to help in a potential mass evacuation. The federal government has rejected a request from Alberta to change the criminal code to allow people to carry pepper spray for self-defense. Alberta Justice Minister Casey Madu posted an open letter last month to Federal Justice Minister David Lametti and Public Safety Minister Bill Blair appealing for the move. He had said Albertans need to be able to defend themselves against hate motivated crimes. Lametti and Blair have responded in a joint statement discussing the idea, saying, quote, all weapons that are prohibited are prohibited for a reason. After a 21-month investigation, Manitoba RCMP announced first-degree murder charges in the homicide of a 29-year-old mother of two from northern Manitoba. Bobby Lynn Moose's body was found in Thompson on October 17, 2019, after going missing 17 days earlier outside a Thompson Walmart. Today, we can announce that Jack Clarence Flett a 52-year-old male from Thompson was arrested in Thompson by officers of the Major Crime Services. Mr. Flett has been charged with first-degree murder in connection with the homicide of Bobby Lynn Moose and remanded in custody. It's truly heartbreaking that such a young woman as Bobby was so violently taken away from her family, her loved ones, and her home community of Netsichewayasik Cree Nation. I think it's really important for us to sit here today and pause to remember the victim of this terrible crime. Montreal police are promising to come down hard on perpetrators of gun violence after a triple homicide in the city's east end Monday night. A senior officer called the shooting at an apartment building that left three dead and two injured unprecedented. Around uh, 7 p.m., um, a few dozen uh, Shots of firearms uh, were shot on a building situated at 9301 Boulevard Pera in uh, Rivière des Prairies. Uh, those shots, um, they, uh, they hit five men uh, who were inside apartment two, inside or in front of the apartment two. Unfortunately, three of them died. Uh, and uh, the two others are stable, and we do not fear for their uh, safety anymore. Uh, all of the men hit by those, uh, those uh, shots uh, were known by our service, um, and one of the deceased was actually carrying a firearm on him. There's an important uh, deployment, a police deployment, uh, as we speak to investigate the crime scene, and it will be going on for many hours. This, this event is unprecedented in Montreal, and it's unacceptable.
An update to a story we brought you yesterday where gunshots were fired near the Pentagon, resulting in multiple injuries Tuesday morning. Well, a police officer has died after being stabbed during that burst of violence at a transit station outside of the Pentagon. The suspect was shot by law enforcement and died at the scene. It all occurred on a Metro bus platform at the Pentagon Transit Center, just steps from the Pentagon building. The Pentagon Metro Station is probably one of the busiest in the transportation system. It is a hub for commuters as well as building occupants. There are a number of measures that we have in place out there. Every time an incident occurs, whether it's here or anywhere else across the nation or in the world, we, we do after actions on those, we examine them, we look for things that we can do to improve. But right now, again, it's still pending. We will certainly, as, as this investigation concludes, take another look at any measures. Our mission is, is to protect not just the building, but the community that we serve that transits through that station. If Prime Minister Justin Trudeau calls an election soon, it will trigger a vote that could see Canadians casting mail-in ballots in droves. Chief Electoral Officer Stephanie Perot, uh, Stefan Perot rather, says his department has plans in place to ensure an election can be conducted safely and produced trustworthy results. He's estimating as many as 5 million Canadians could opt to use mail-in ballots, up from fewer than 50,000 in the 2019 election. It could take two to five days to complete the mail-in ballot count, meaning the results of close races in some writings won't be known immediately. Our political affairs contributor, Brian Lilly, says he thinks an election could be called as early as this weekend. But he also says it might not be such a slam dunk to win a majority government, as Trudeau will need to be very strategic when campaigning in the West. Maybe pick up one in Calgary with a, a counselor for a guy that wanted to be on council running. Maybe if he convinces former Edmonton mayor Don Iveson to run, maybe he picks up one there. But he's not really going to win there. He's not going to win in Saskatchewan. And his base, you know, his support in Manitoba is tenuous. There, it, there are not enough seats, unless he sweeps Ontario, there are not enough seats in play for him to easily get that majority. So he needs to find seats in Western Canada. Western Canada will matter this election for both leading parties. Catch the full interview with political affairs contributor Brian Lilly coming up after the business news. Well, if you plan to travel, expect some delays. The union representing about 9,000 Canadian Border Service Agency workers has served a strike notice. It says its members will begin job action across the country on Friday and is warning there may be long lines and lengthy delays at border crossings and airports. Workers have been without a contract for about three years. The job action comes just three days before Canada will let fully vaccinated Americans enter the country without having to quarantine. For the first time in 93 years, a Canadian has won the Olympic gold medal in the men's 200 meters. 26-year-old Andre de Grasse didn't just win the race, he set a new Canadian record of 19.62 seconds. It's his fifth Olympic medal, but his first gold. DeGrasse is now tied with Phil Edwards for the most medals win, the most, most medal wins rather by a Canadian track and field athlete. Well, both a heat warning and severe thunderstorm watch have been issued by Environment Canada for Lethbridge. I will tell you how much rain we could expect this evening coming up after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back. Uh, heat warning is still in effect for much of southern Alberta. Also, Environment Canada issuing a severe thunderstorm watch for this evening, meaning that conditions could be favorable for severe lightning, strong winds, heavy rains, and possibly even some hail. Uh, looking into tomorrow, Thursday, sunshine, 32 degrees. However, be aware that we could see some fog in the morning and some local smoke in the afternoon into Friday, looking at a high of 33 degrees, mix of sun and cloud. 27 for, for Saturday. For Sunday, down to 22 degrees. That'll feel quite a bit cooler. Uh, looking at possibility of some showers Sunday night into Monday. Mix of sun and cloud, 22 degrees. Chance of showers also Monday evening. And into next Tuesday, uh, sunshine and 26 degrees. So we're seeing that little roller coaster effect going real high into the 30s down to 22 and then back up to 26. Uh, average high for this time of year, 26. Average low, 11 degrees. 35 degrees was our high temperature on this day back in 1939. And on this day back in 2005, we had our lowest temperature, which was 
4 degrees. 606 is when the sun rose this morning and our sun is set this evening right at 9.06 p.m. So day's getting a little tiny bit shorter there. Looking to the west coast tomorrow, a mix of sun and cloud in Victoria, 25 degrees the high, 26 in Vancouver, beautiful sunny skies. Uh, in Edmonton tomorrow, sunshine, hazy, uh, 28 degrees in, in uh, Calgary, rather 30 degrees, heat warning in effect for Calgary. Looking at that local smoke there tomorrow as well. Looking to a Saskatoon mix of sun and cloud tomorrow, 29 degrees. There could be a slight chance of showers later too. 27 in Regina uh, with sunshine, hazy, a widespread smoke in Winnipeg with a high of 24 as there is an air quality uh, statement in effect for that area with the surrounding wildfires in the area. Toronto, sunshine, 28. 29 in Ottawa and Montreal with the sunny skies in both of those cities as well should be hot and beautiful in the central part of the country for sure. Over to the east coast now, Fredericton looking at chance of showers, 22 degrees the high, a risk of a thunderstorm there in Halifax and chance of showers as well, 24 degrees the high there. Charlottetown looking at some rain, looking up to possibly 10 millimeters of rain there, actually two millimeters, 10 millimeters in Halifax, that is, Sunshine in St. John's, Newfoundland with winds up to 40 kilometer per hour gusts and 25 degrees. So there you have it. That is your forecast. Microsoft says employees must be fully vaccinated to enter the company's U.S. offices and other work sites starting next month. The Redmond, Washington-based tech giant has told employees it will require proof of vaccination for all employees, vendors, and any guests entering Microsoft buildings in the U.S. The company also says it will have a process to accommodate employees who have a medical condition or other protected reasons such as religion, which prevent them from getting vaccinated. The company is also delaying its return to the office until October 4th. Robinhood's stock is flying again, jumping so much Wednesday that its trading was temporarily halted three times in the first half hour. Shares of Robinhood markets were up 44.4% this afternoon, accelerating what's already been a blistering week of gains. It's a sharp turnaround from their lackluster debut last week when the stock dropped 8.4% from its initial price of $38 last Thursday. The year started off gangbusters with the Real Estate Board of Greater Vancouver saying uh, that sales cooled somewhat in July, but the BC Board says numbers were still up compared to last year. Home sale listings and prices were down 11.6% from June, but overall were still up 6.3% compared to the year before. The Home Price Index Composite Benchmark price hit nearly $1.2 million last month, up 13.8% compared to last July. Now here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was down 36 points to 20,329. The Dow was down 323 points to 34,792. The S&P 500 was down 20 points to 4,403. And the Nasdaq was up 19 points to finish at 14,780. West Texas Intermediate Oil was down 241 to 6815 US per barrel. Natural gas was up 13 cents to 416 US. Gold was up 4 cents to 1811 US an ounce, and silver was even to finish at 2538 US an ounce. Wheat is at $415 per metric ton. Barley is at $410, canola $865, and corn is at $443 per metric ton. Live cattle were up 80 cents to 124.05. Feeder cattle were up 30 cents to 159.20. Lean hogs were up 40 cents to 109.48. And the Canadian dollar was down slightly to finish at 79.71 US. Recapping one of our top stories today, Alberta's top doctor is apologizing for causing confusion, fear and anger about the province's plan to eliminate remaining COVID public health measures. In a column sent to media outlets, Dr. Dina Hinshaw says her words have caused some people to think she believes the pandemic is over. Hinshaw says that that was not her intended message. She says isolation measures were incredibly disruptive and are no longer necessary with vaccine protection. Hinshaw says lifting isolation requirements, asymptomatic testing, and eliminating contact tracing will also allow the province to focus on other health threats, 
such as opioid deaths. Coming up, we speak with Toronto Sun columnist Brian Lilly about why he thinks a federal election could be called as hastily as this weekend. Stay with us. That is coming up right after the break. Will there be a fourth wave of COVID-19 and is a federal election call just around the corner? Here to discuss this and more is our federal political contributor, Toronto Sun columnist Brian Lilly. Brian, thanks for joining us again. So great to have you on. Oh, my pleasure as always, Jeanette. Thank you. So, Brian, an election call could come as early as this weekend. So, Brian, what are candidates, staffers, and journalists being told in terms of getting ready? Well, staffers were probably warned before anybody else. They were told back in, I don't know, late May, early June on the liberal side, they were warned, okay, get your vacation time. If you need downtime when Parliament uh, rises at the end of June, get it out of the way in July because you need to be back in Ottawa for early August. And then a couple of weeks ago, candidates were told, rent office space for the next two months. Uh, okay, well, that's a pretty good sign of an election. As for journalists, very few of us being told what will happen other than, yep, they plan on having rallies, they plan on going coast to coast to coast, as they like to say, but okay, how exactly is it going to happen? How will the campaign tours and buses work? That part we don't know, but all systems still seem go for a call that could come this weekend, and if not, the following week, because remember, you know, those $500 checks start going out to seniors the week of August 16th, and they don't want those going to waste. They want people to get a check and then think, oh, vote Liberal. Interesting. So now, speaking of which, the Liberals have had some gains in certain polls. Others have been tighter with the NDP surging and the Conservatives nipping at the Liberals' heels. So what do the parties need to do in order to win or change the situation from what it is now? Yeah, the polls have been a bit of a mixed bag. There were a bunch of polls towards the end of June showing a wide lead, and there's been one or two since then from firms that I don't really use. Um, a lot of the firms that I do use, you know, such as Angus Reid, uh, Ipsos, um, Leger, they're showing a tighter race now of between three and five, six points. That's kind of the range as opposed to back, you know, a while ago. It was 12 to 15 points. It'll be a blowout. So it's tighter. Okay, so what does that mean, though? Because we know that the Liberals aren't necessarily going to do well in somewhere like where you're sitting in Alberta. We don't know what the NDP surge could mean if it hits here where I'm sitting in Toronto. So the NDP, their, a surge for them is about 20%. They need to tighten down areas like where I am in Toronto. They need to make sure that they are competitive in industrial cities and heartlands across the country. They also need to make sure that they're competitive in BC. BC is, is going to be a three-way three race, so that's going to be interesting. So all of that's going on. For the Conservatives, they need to make sure that they've got enough negative stuff in the window about Justin Trudeau, but that they also have enough positive things that Aaron O'Toole is going to be able to say, all right, you don't like that guy? Here's an alternative. You know, there are a lot of people that don't like Justin Trudeau. They're already not voting for him or they're holding their nose. You need to give them another reason. You know, I, I, I've been talking to a few pollsters who say they don't know why Trudeau's going to the polls because they don't know what his ballot question is. And I keep saying it'll be a variation of Stevie Wonder's Isn't She Wonderful turn to Isn't He Wonderful? And they'll just say that over and over again. There's no real reason for him to go to the polls other than they want a majority government again, I don't know what their their value proposition to voters will mm -hmm. be. So it's going to be an interesting race, you know, assuming we get there. Oh, it will be so interesting. Now, I, I, it's funny because you're saying you're sitting in Ontario, I'm sitting in Alberta. At, in the West, we often say the election is decided before the polls even close out here because of the size of Ontario and Quebec, naturally. So if we do have an election, do you expect that to happen again this time, Brian? No, because I think there could be um, seats in play in Alberta. Right now, I think, um, isn't it every seat is held by the Conservatives or all but one? Pretty much, and yes. Yeah. It, but, okay, what is going to happen with the Maverick Party? We know that uh, Aaron O'Toole and his Aaron Bucks carbon tax program have alienated a lot of the, the Western voters with the Conservative Party. 
I've heard from people who have been stalwarts of the Conservative Party saying, I'm thinking of voting Maverick this time. So if that happens, does that peel away enough votes that the Conservatives lose? You know, if it happens in Calgary or Edmonton, that could definitely be the case. If it happens in Lethbridge, less so. I don't expect the People's Party of Canada to be much of a, um, you know, much of a, a factor. They weren't in the last election and nothing's changed to, to make it different. But Maverick could be a real game changer on the prairies uh, in terms of votes. But as I mentioned earlier, British Columbia is going to be a three-way race. So they're all very tight by the polls that I'm reading, the polls that I trust. They're all very tight. Justin Trudeau, when he won his majority in 2015, took about half of BC's seats. He's going to have a great deal of difficulty doing that the way things sit now. He's got, uh, I think, about seven to ten seats. He got 17 back in 2015. He needs those to get his majority because maybe pick up one in Calgary with a, a councillor for a guy that wanted to be on council running. Maybe if he convinces former Edmonton Mayor Don Iveson to run, maybe he picks up one there. But he's not really going to win there. He's not going to win in Saskatchewan. And his base, you know, his support in Manitoba is tenuous. There, it, there are not enough seats unless he sweeps Ontario. There are not enough seats in play for him to easily get that majority. So he needs to find seats in Western Canada. Western Canada will matter this election for both leading parties, not just the Conservatives. Yeah, it should be interesting to see what happens for sure. Now, Brian, you say one key clue that the Trudeau Liberals won an election is that they are talking about abortion again. So why does that point to an election? Because the Liberals talk about abortion more than any pro-lifer I know. They talk about abortion more than pro-life activists that I've known for a long time. And they really talk about abortion when it's time for an election. So Justin Trudeau went to New Brunswick last week. He started talking about how he would withhold millions of dollars in funding from New Brunswick because they won't fund a private abortion clinic there. It's a small province. They have three hospitals, three main hospitals that do, they're the only ones that do a lot of procedures. And they're the only ones that do publicly funded abortions. Well, this has always bothered the liberals. They want private clinics to do abortions, like the Morgenthaler Clinic that is steps from Parliament Hill. So, by the way, it turns out that they were only withholding about $140,000. They keep raising this issue because they know, they knew that last week, late last week, Aaron O'Toole, the conservative leader, would be swinging through. So he gets asked about the issue and he says, look, I'm pro-choice, but I'll leave it up to the provinces to define, uh, decide how to spend health care dollars. All of a sudden, Justin Trudeau's tweeting about, don't take away a woman's right to choose. This is sacred. Men shouldn't have a say. Well, who was talking about that? Oh, I know. Justin Trudeau was. But it gets him media attention. It gets him into the cycle. And it may not win him a ton of votes. It may not switch votes, but it gets his base excited. And often in politics, that's part of what you want to do. And so he wants to get his base excited. He wants to get you Democrats who are really concerned about this issue to say, well, I better vote Justin Trudeau or, you know, abortion is going to disappear across Canada. That's what every time they bring this issue up, that's why. Not that they're actually going to do anything. They just want to use it as a stick and a carrot to try and get votes. Okay. Uh, Brian, COVID will likely play a role in this election, right? So some people will give the Trudeau Liberals credit for their handling of the pandem pandemic, while others, of course, will blame them. But what about a potential rise in cases that some medical experts are warning about? What do you think about that? Well, that's the wild card. I mean, and I know some of your viewers will be saying some people are giving Trudeau credit. Yeah, some people do, like they do for all governments. So we'll give them credit. Well, well you know, we're in a tough time. The government's doing its best. And then there are the, the folks that just believe anything Justin Trudeau says. So, yeah, they're going to give him credit. Others will criticize him. But here's the part that the swing voters that might be giving him credit for handling the pandemic may get antsy. If there is a rise in cases. Now, look, I, you know, we could very well have a fourth wave, Jeanette, but it's going to be very different. It, it's not going to look the same. So we have a rise in cases. It doesn't necessarily mean an increase in hospitalizations. It doesn't mean an increase in deaths because so many people are vaccinated. So many people have had COVID. There is a natural immunity and there's a, a medical immunity through the vaccination. So it's not going to be the same sort of wave. 
But the people that are so nervous about this that they want to hug on tight to whichever government is in power are the ones who might get really upset and say, we're having this rising cases because you called an election that sent people scurrying across the country, knocking on doors, holding rallies, and, and they're going to blame him. I normally don't believe in calling an election early gets the government punished. There's a couple of rare examples in Canadian politics. And people point to one in Ontario back in the 80s, but that's a rare exception. But in this case, with the pandemic still lingering and people still nervous, especially here in Ontario, that could definitely hurt mm -hmm. Justin Trudeau. Now, you said something interesting. You said that it could look very different this time. So let's. So if, if there is a fourth wave of COVID, Brian, do you think that we are going to see a return to lockdowns and those high death rates? Are you are thinking it's going to look different because of all the vaccinations? What do you think is going to happen there? Well, even the third wave looked very different than the first and the second in terms of deaths. Yes, hospitalizations went up, including in Alberta, including Ontario and many parts of the country. Hospitalizations went up and there was a strain on the healthcare system. We're talking about more than 80% of the population age 12 and over having their first shot. We're closing in on more than 70% of the population age 12 and over having both shots. Yeah. Yeah. Could it be higher? Sure. But there's always going to be some people who can't get the vaccine due to allergies, due to medical conditions. Absolutely. They may be yeah. immunocompromised or they're, they're against it and they don't want it. And you can't force people to undergo a medical treatment. That, that is not something that I think um, should stand in a free and democratic society. So we're over 80 percent. It'll keep creeping up a little bit at a time over the next few months. So that should be enough to say that even if cases rise, the deaths and the hospitalizations won't go in sync. In the United Kingdom, they have been seeing a rise in cases since May. They have not seen a, a corresponding rise in hospitalizations and deaths. They, they started going through their latest wave. I think it's their third. They didn't have a third wave at the same time we did, it came later. They started going through that with a much lower rate of protection from the vaccine, and, and it still worked very well. We're ahead of them. So, yes, brace yourselves. You know, the, the Ontario uh, chief medical officer said the other day, uh, we need to normalize that some people are going to have COVID, and they're going to have to stay home because they're sick, just like other res respiratory diseases. Yeah, absolutely. That's good news, what you're saying, too, about the UK, and hopefully... That uh, is a reflection of what's going to come for sure. Now, something that's been in the news a lot lately, there's been a big push to get Afghan interpreters who helped Canadian troops during our war effort there settled back into Canada. But while veterans have been pushing for this to happen, the opposition says that the Trudeau government has been dragging their feet or dropping the ball. So what happened over the last week with a website set up to help them and a false deadline? So, yeah, it was a bizarre thing last week that, that happened. Look, the, the Conservatives have been on this for a while now. NDP leader Jagmeet Singh has jumped on board. And, and I can tell you that veterans have been running ad campaigns. They've had them in, in my paper in The Sun uh, on a regular basis for a couple of weeks now saying, call Immigration Minister Marco Mendocino, tell him that we need to get these people into the country. They were there for us. We need them in. But the Trudeau government... They were slow on this. They didn't want to do it. There had been a program years ago under the Harper government, and I'm told about 1,200 people came through. Now, that program eventually closed because no one was applying anymore. But what's changed? Well, the, the Americans have withdrawn, and the Taliban is resurgent. And so there are still some people who are at risk. And the hope is they were there for us, bring them into Canada. The Trudeau government didn't want to do anything. Then what they did, they announced in the middle of last week, We'll bring in a, a new program, but you've got 72 hours. You've got until this Saturday to apply and have your application done in full. They sent out documents that did, they had spelling mistakes. They didn't have Government of Canada logos on them. Um, communications in Afghanistan are spotty at best. And if you're in hiding from the Taliban and you're getting these documents, you might be looking at them and saying, are these real? Because, you know, I'm worried that I'm being tricked into coming out of hiding. Absolutely. They dropped, they dropped the three-day requirement, but 
it, you know, the website that you were supposed to apply on crashed. There have been so many problems with it. And the Trudeau government just hasn't seemed like they've got their heart in it for reasons that I can't understand. These were people that were there for us. I know people, both military and journal journalists, who relied on them when they were in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. For us to turn our backs now seems awfully cold. Toronto Sun columnist Brian Lilly, thanks so much for your time today. Always appreciated. Thank you. Municipal elections will be taking place across Alberta on October the 18th. And today, we have the opportunity to speak with one of our mayoral candidates here in Lethbridge, Stephen Mogden. Stephen, welcome to Bridge City News. Thanks very much, Hal. Nice to be here today. Now, first of all, let's dive into exactly who Stephen Mogden is. What do you do for a living? Tell me about your connection to Lethbridge and why you decided to run for mayor. Yeah, for sure. Uh, again, thanks for having me, Hal. So I've uh, been a Lethbridge resident for 20 years now, just a little over 20 years. Uh, I grew up in Calgary, but uh, moved down to Lethbridge after I uh, graduated from law school. Uh, I am married, uh, have been for almost 24 years. Uh, we have two, uh, son, two sons, uh, one of whom is uh, uh, over 18. Uh, I'm a lawyer, so I've been uh, practicing here in Lethbridge ever since I came to Lethbridge uh, with uh, Stringham Law, uh, was previously Stringham Denneke. Uh People might know that name. Uh, but yeah, I've, I've been with the firm uh, the whole time. I've uh, been a partner here for more than 10 years. Um, so that's what I do in my uh, day job. Uh, the nice thing about being a lawyer uh, here in town is that it affords you the ability to uh, do some other things as well. And so I've always taken advantage of that and served my community on uh, various boards. Um, uh, currently, I'm sitting on the YMCA board and have been a, been a past chair of that and been involved with that for going on about six years now. Uh, previously, um, president of the Chamber of Commerce. I've been on the board for the Downtown Business Revitalization Zone for uh, two terms, so six years altogether. I've uh, been involved with the John Howard Society and with the uh, Lethbridge uh, uh, Economic Recovery Task Force that Economic Development Lethbridge uh, put together. Uh, so I've always been uh, involved in my community and, and supporting my community and things that I think are important. And uh, so that's probably the biggest reason that I wanted to run uh, was that serving in that capacity as mayor of Lethbridge would be kind of the biggest stage for me to be able to, to do that, to help my community. Um, and uh, I think it's going to be important. Now, Stephen, you say you want to bring a positive and collaborative approach when it comes to leadership here in the city. Can you give an example of what you see as divisive leadership versus positive leadership? Uh, absolutely, Hal. Uh, so we don't really have to look very far to see an example of uh, a divisive leadership uh, situation on council. Really, the past four years, the past term uh, of council has seen a lot of uh, uh, division, uh, a lot of uh, acrimony, uh, a lot of personal attacks. Uh, and I think that's really unfortunate and something that people look at and uh, wonder why that should be happening. Um, and that's bad enough. But really, the, the bigger problem with that is that it prevents uh, decisions from being made in a manner that best reflects the community. Uh, now, I'm not saying that council should at all times be, you know, uh, in unanimity or uh, have a full consensus on anything. There's, there's always room for healthy debate. Uh, you'll always see that in any group of people. But uh, when it comes to making decisions, what we've seen over the past is uh, people forming into camps uh, here on council uh, and really getting entrenched uh, and failing to uh, continue listening uh, to other ideas. And ultimately, that results in poorer decisions for our community. Uh, and well, that'll, that'll bring a long-term uh, negative effect to us. So uh, that's something where we need to, to work on that and be a lot more uh, collaborative as we move forward on council. Now, most people agree, Stephen, that there's a real need Need to help those struggling with addiction and homelessness here in our city. We still have the opioid crisis. Now, the supervised consumption site was a very divisive topic here in our city with people strongly in favor and as well, a lot of business owners strongly opposed. Where do you stand? Absolutely. Well, you know, with that uh, supervised consumption site, uh, there were some problems with, with how it was run. Uh, its location might have been uh, chosen a little better. That being said, uh, you know, I, I don't want to cast too much blame on uh, previous decisions for that uh, because something had to, uh, to happen fairly quickly with that. Um, a lot of people tend to forget that, you know, we, we were dealing with a fairly unprecedented uh, problem in terms of the op opioid crisis. 
uh, hitting Lethbridge. And uh, so something had to be done. Um, you know, sometimes we'll see mistakes in execution when that uh, takes place, but, uh, you know, th there needed to be something uh, taking place and something uh, into, uh, into effect. So, so we did. Um, I think a city that is uh, as large as Lethbridge is going to have some issues with, uh, with drug use. Uh, I think that's just um, to be expected with, you know, the, the size of population that we have. And because of that, I think we need to have uh, supervised consumption services available to people. Uh, we do have some of that right now, but supervised consumption services need to be uh, complemented by a number of other services. So you think of things like mental health supports, uh, the ability uh, to have uh, detox services, uh, rehabilitation recovery services, um, Housing, uh, so traditional, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, transitional uh, supportive housing. Uh, all of those things are necessary to really set people up to overcome what is, a, you know, a very, very difficult problem to overcome, uh, and hopefully get towards uh, success and and being a you know very positive uh, contributing member of, of our society. So we need to have those things in place. Uh, I would uh, give some kudos to uh, our provincial government for taking some steps. Uh, recently in, in announcing some funding for uh, for a facility out to, uh, in the county, but but you know close enough that it should benefit Lethbridge residents. Uh, we need to have some more of that as we move forward. Let's talk about a potential dry site similar to the proposal that the mustard seed recently brought forward. Now, do you think there are some potential places in our city where this could work and maybe have this dry site work with organizations like Streets Alive and the Soup Kitchen? Well, and certainly, uh, Hal, I think we need to have uh, a range of services available for people. Uh, some people will not uh, find a lot of success with a dry site, but some people will. Um, and that can fill a definite need for people. So I think we need to look at having those things in place. I mean, I think we need to make sure that we are locating those uh, carefully and going about it in a very deliberative and collaborative manner. It's something where we need to make sure that we are engaging our community, engaging our uh, community leaders to find suitable sites uh, having a dialogue with people that are going to be affected by that site, whether it's a neighbor, whether it's you know somebody that that is in the area for services or what have you, uh, we need to make sure that that's something that's not just sort of dropped on a, a location. Uh, and part of that is having a, a a broader conversation with the community, so that you know the the rest of the community understands why it's being uh, chosen for, for wherever it's being uh, suggested for, uh, what the benefits are and what the drawbacks are. I mean, you, you tend to see uh, people leap to, con to conclusions about uh, what a site, you know, whether it's a dry site or not, uh, what a site like that is going to bring with it. Uh, and, and in some cases that just really sort of clouds the discussion and prevents uh, you know, prevents having some success in finding a place that's going to it's going to work for the community. Stephen, Stats Canada says when it comes to crime severity index, it's really not good news for Lethbridge. We're number one, especially when it comes to petty crime. Explain your vision as potential mayor for our city on cutting down on crime. For sure, uh, always a uh, always a difficult. Um, subject to uh, to crack. That being said, uh, I think that the same um, crime severity index report uh, that was just uh, released uh, also shows that, uh, you know, things are improving uh, in Lethbridge uh, in terms of, uh, you know, benchmarking us from this year compared to last year. Uh, and then uh, looking forward, uh, we need to assess what the effect of you know bringing in a new uh, police chief uh, and having uh, having him get his uh, legs under him and and the department working uh, as he wants it to be working uh, the effect that that's going to have as well. But greater than that, Hal, uh, I think we need to make sure that we are uh, making a serious uh, attempt to uh, provide support for people in our community. Uh, you know, we have a lot of people that struggle. Uh, with with various uh, issues and crime tends to stem from those issues the the mental health issues the addictions issues uh, that, that's really why uh, those those crime activities take place now let's talk about the million dollars that was cut from the Lethbridge police budget would you put a million dollars back in to help Chief Shaheen Medizade and his officers keep our streets safe 
I think it's something that we need to constantly have a, a discussion about. Uh, we need, I mean, policing is is a very large budget item uh, in, in any city, and and Lethbridge is no different than that. As we move forward, we need, we need to make sure that we are uh, addressing what the department needs uh, when they need it. Whether that means that we're uh, replacing some or all of that uh, million dollar budget, that's a decision that the council is going to have to uh, come up with. Um, it's not something that I can say right at this point that that will uh, definitely be needed uh, or not. But as, as we move forward, we're going to have to look at where our police funding uh, is uh, going and where it's come from. Um, you know, the, the reality is if you cut uh, a million dollars out of a budget, that's going to have some impacts. Um, so we need to look at what the, what that looks like as we move forward. Let's talk about a potential third bridge for the west side over the Old Man River. Uh, Lethbridge Mayor Chris Spearman says because it's all of it's in Lethbridge, none of it's on provincial land, 13% property tax increase. Alberta, you know, Lethbridge residents will have to foot the bill for the entire bridge. What are your thoughts on that? Do we need a third bridge here in Lethbridge in the city? Uh, we may. Um, and I'm sorry to be, uh, I don't know if you would call that evasive or not, but uh, I think what we really need to do, Hal, is take a look at uh, what are the costs, what are the, uh, what are the traffic flows? I mean, does it, does it make sense for us to have that now? Does it make sense for us to be planning for that in the next five years or 10 years? Uh, there's a lot of issues at play here, uh, budget issues, uh, growth issues. I tend to think uh, myself that uh, a third bridge would foster growth uh, and would encourage uh, movement between the west side uh, and the south side. And I think uh, by itself, that is uh, ultimately a good thing, but it has to make sense for us economically. Uh, we need to make sure that, you know, are, are we able to get grants for uh, to go towards that from uh, the different orders of government? If so, uh, maybe that is something that we can uh, that we can look at uh, putting in place sooner rather than later. Eventually, we'll need it. I mean, it's it's just that simple. Uh, whether we're there yet now, um, that remains to be seen. You've gone on record saying that inclusion and reconciliation are very important to you, Stephen. Can you share what an inclusive city looks like in your view? Uh, absolutely. So any community is made up of uh, you know. A, a myriad uh, of people and they, they have different abilities and different challenges. Uh, and so a community I think is ultimately judged on how well it deals with people who face those, uh, those challenges. Uh, it, you know, and, and that comes about in various ways, right? Uh, some people have uh, difficulty with uh, things like uh, housing. Some people have difficulties with uh, maybe language issues uh, if they're uh, you know, uh, an immigrant from, uh, from another, uh, another community. Um, some people may have difficulty in you know, facing a job interview or you know, finding suitable work for their, uh, for their abilities. Uh, all of those things are things that we as a community need to look at uh, making sure that we're, we are bringing those people in as best we can. And the city, I think, can play a key role in supporting organizations that interface uh, with those people and making sure that you know, if you are a Lethbridge resident and you want to be involved, whether it's you know, employment, volunteer activities, uh, whatever the case may be, you have the ability to do that and you don't face uh, you know, additional barriers. Now, some people are saying this election really is a two-horse race between current city councillor Blaine Hagan and former two-term councillor Bridget Mearns. How do you respond to that, Stephen? Uh, I guess we'll see what happens on October 18th. <laughs> I guess we will, that's right. Now, when people think of Lethbridge, they not only think of the legendary wind here, but also agriculture. Some say we should not put all of our apples into the ag basket, but diversify like other cities are doing. Outside of agriculture, what other business do you think we should attract to our city to help boost our local economy? Well, so, so two, uh, Hal, uh, one of which I think is tourism. Uh, I, I think we can be doing a, a lot more uh, on tourism, uh, sport tourism, uh, and taking advantage uh, of the, the many great sites that we have uh, in uh, Lethbridge, around Lethbridge, close, close to Lethbridge. Uh, so that's one. Uh, another that you traditionally look at is uh, technology, right? Uh, technology services that don't necessarily need to be located in one place uh, or another. Uh, that's something that we can look at uh, trying to attract and foster here in Lethbridge. I mean, 
we have a, a great potential uh, that we are you know, currently realizing on in terms of our, our role in the, the agri-food sector. And that's wonderful for, for Lethbridge, right? Um, like you say, you, if you put all your, all your eggs in one basket, uh, you might face some difficulties with that. So I think it uh, is good for any community to diversify its economy. Stephen Mogden is one of the mayoral candidates in Lethbridge, and he's hoping for your vote on October the 18th. Stephen, thanks so much for your time today. Thanks very much, Hal. Always a pleasure. And behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, I'm Hal Roberts. God bless, and thanks for watching.